Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 15. I'll be reading verses 1 through 3 and then I'll be reading verses 11 through 24 and verse 32. And this is what it says. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near Jesus to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to complain saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And he told them this parable saying, And he said, A man had two sons, the younger of them, said to his father, Father, give me a share of the estate that is coming to me. And so he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey to a distant country. And there he squandered his estate in wild living. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began doing without. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he longed to have his fill of the carob pods that the pigs were eating. And no one was giving him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired laborers have more than enough bread? But I am dying here from hunger. I will set out and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired laborers. So he set out and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced and kissed him. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. Let's eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. And then in verse 32, The father says, because we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has begun to, to live and was lost and has been found. Pray with me. Jesus, this day you offer life. A life that's abundant, a life that's full. Lord, grant us strength enough to you, for you to live your life through us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I think this is probably one of the most familiar of all the, the stories that Jesus told. The story of the prodigal son. I think there's something about that story in the pro, of the prodigal son that, you know, our imaginations can quickly go to that place that's a distant country. That place where nobody knows us so there's no expectation. I think... I think our imaginations can quickly go to the, what does wild living mean? I don't think it's very hard to figure out at all. You know, what would it be like? No responsibility, no expectation, no one knows you. And certainly, certainly, there are no consequences. I don't, I don't think anybody would have ever had to have opened the Bible to hear that story of the prodigal son. It's made its way into to our everyday language. 
I don't think you ever have to have heard the story to, to know or have read the story in the Bible to know that a part of the story is also a, a son that stayed at home. And the son that stayed at home, he did everything that was right. But doing what's right in this son's eyes, well, that's no reward in itself. There at least needs to be somebody who you're better than, somebody that you can punish, and, and somebody that you, know, you can feel good about feeling bad about. And this was the son that stayed at home. He refused to take part in the celebration. He refused to take part in the rejoicing that his brother was home. Well, I think it's, it's easy for our minds to, to go to that, that place. But the part that I think we rarely hear is about the father. And that's where Jesus begins the story. It's about a father. A father who had two sons. And it's a story not just about the prodigal son. It's about the compassionate father. A story about the compassionate father. And I, I, I believe that because Jesus is talking to two audiences here. And we read about that in the first three verses. He was talking to the tax collectors and sinners. That's one audience. Those were the folks that believed they were in trouble with God. That there was no way, no way at all that they, they would be welcomed by God. But then the other audience that he was talking to, we read, we read about them in the, these first three verses. It was the, the Pharisees and the scribes, that they began to complain. And the reason they complained is because, well, they thought God's compassion was the same as their compassion. And wherever their compassion ended, it, God's compassion must have ended as well. These were definitely folks that had stayed at home, that right living was no reward in itself, not unless you, you weren't better than somebody, not, not unless you could com complain about the way somebody else was living, that, I mean, why? Why do what's right if you can't at least be better than somebody? And that God's compassion, well, he was a little bit loose with his forgiveness. And Jesus is, is, is talking to, to both of these audiences here when he talks about a father who had two sons. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Verse 20 tells us that the father felt compassion. This is a story about the father's compassion. And this is what it says in verse 20. It says, so he set out and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him. Well, he, the son, the son that had gone to the distant country, the son that had squandered the estate, the son that had engaged in wild living, when he came home, long before he got there, his father's eyes were peeled on the horizon. Well, he was still a long way off. I think this may be one of the most beautiful verses in the whole of the Bible. That the father's compassion was, was, was seeking, it was searching, it, it, it was looking while he was still a long. He didn't wait till he was all cleaned up and, and home. He does, didn't wait till he was better than he had been. It was while he was still a long way off. Phil Bianci in his book, Disappointment with God, tells a story that, that helps me out here. He tells a story about going to visit his mother, that his father had died many years before. And he and his mother were looking through a box of old photos, and they came across a photo of Philip when he was eight months old. Well, there were lots of pictures when he was about that age, but this particular picture, it was torn and folded and tattered, and he couldn't understand why his mother held on to this picture when there were so many other pictures that were in better condition. That's when his mother shared with him a story that her husband, Philip's father, had died while he was still a baby, that he had contracted polio when he was only 24 years old, and, and he was required to for the last four months of his life to live in an iron lung 
He was paralyzed. So he couldn't raise his arms. He couldn't move his legs. He couldn't even move his head from one side to the other. So his father asked Philip's mother to, if he could have a picture of his two sons. And there in the knobs and the dials of, of that iron lung, that, that big metal cylindrical tube that was, was keeping him alive, his mother began to, to pry and, and work those two pictures, one of Philip and one of his brother. And that's when it hit Philip that his father had spent the last four months of his life looking at those that he loved most. And this is what he writes about it. He says, the emotions I felt when my, brother, when my mother showed me the crumbled photo were the very same emotions I felt that February night in a college dorm room when I first believed in a God of love. Someone is there, I realized. Someone is there who loves me. It was a startling feeling of wild hope, a feeling so new and overwhelming that it seemed worth risking my life on. The Father loves you, and He's worth risking His life on you. That He gave His life for you that you might have life. And in turn, give that life back to him. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That it was while we were still a long way off. Before we were cleaned up. Before we were as good as we could be or better than we had been. It was while we were still a long way off. Our Father, God, has compassion for you and for me. And it's that kind of compassion, knowing, knowing that he loves us from a, a long way off, that even from a long way off, that it, it begins to transform who we are. But he, in the story that Jesus tells, the father didn't just feel compassion, he did something about it. I began reading verse 20, so he set out and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him. And it says, and he ran and embraced and kissed him. That he didn't just feel something for the son that was a long way off, that he ran and embraced and he kissed him. In the first century for a man to lift his robe and begin running, it was, it was an embarrassment. It was undignified. It just wasn't done. But his love for his son was greater than his embarrassment. His love and his compassion for his son was greater than his dignity and his pride. That God is a seeking and a searching and a, and a finding God. And he does whatever it takes wherever you are. Years ago, took my children to the beach. We were at St. Simon's Island, and my brother and his family and my sister and her family, my parents, we were all there at the beach together for that week. We rented three different condos, and when I unloaded the kids and we were unloading the car, all the kids got into the condo, and I made sure that they, they read the number on the door. We were in 107, and I had them tell it back to me. I think my son Taylor was about six or seven years old. We un unloaded the van, and then I went to go buy groceries. Well, when I, when I came back, my brother was waiting for me in the parking deck, and he said, we can't find Taylor. Well, I knew he wasn't a good enough swimmer to, to make it in the pool, so immediately I ran to the pool, and I started calling as loudly as I could. I didn't care who heard. Now, I looked in the bottom of the pool, hoping never to, to see him in the pool, or, and especially at the bottom of the pool, but I called out, and I didn't care who heard. And then I ran as fast as I could out into the beach. I knew he loved the sand. I knew he, that he loved the ocean. And so I ran out there with my eyes peeled on the, on the waves coming in hoping to never see him, and I called as loudly as I could, and I ran up and down the shoreline looking for him. And then it hit me, what if somebody had gotten him and, and had taken him into the parking deck? So I ran back into the parking deck, and I began to look and, and shout between every car. Well, it, that's when my brother came to me, and he said, 
we found him. For the rest of the week, I couldn't hold him close enough. I couldn't hug him enough. I couldn't tell him I loved him enough. I couldn't get my eyes off of him. And to know that God loves you and me even more than that, that he gave his only son for you and for me, and when he rose from the grave, that he sent what Jesus called the helper to give strength to you and to me, that we might respond to the God that's seeking, the God that's searching, the God that's finding That he doesn't just sit off up in heaven feeling compassion for us. He does something about it. He seeks, he searches in order that he might find us. That 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. It's His Spirit, the Spirit of the risen Christ, that brings us to God when we allow Him. He won't work against our own will. He won't defeat when we say no. That He brings us to God only when we allow it, only when we receive Him. And we can do that, not one day, but this day. Our God is a seeking, a searching, and a finding God. And when he rose from the grave, he sent the helper. The Holy Spirit that gives strength where you and I don't have it. To put down our excuses. To respond to his compassion. The Father, he felt compassion in the Father. He shows compassion in this story that Jesus tells. But... We know the part where the father, he called for the fattened calf to to kill it and and he begins to celebrate and to be joyful. And it says that there's there's music and there's dancing. Well, you know, to, to know the story about a prodigal son that's gone into the distant country, we, our imaginations go there quickly. You don't ever have to have opened the Bible to know that story. To know the story of, of a, a, a prodigal son that's, that's engaged in wild living and that there are no expectations on him. There are no, no responsibility, no consequences. You know, our minds can easily go there. To think about a son that stayed at home, he did the right thing. But a son that also believed that there was as that doing right was not its own reward. There needed to be somebody to look down on. And the son that, re, that, that refused to come to the party, that refused to come to the rejoicing, that re, refused to come to the celebration, that we really probably know that part without, without ever reading it in the Bible. But I think for most people, for most folks, that we don't realize that the same father who went to see the, whose eyes were on the horizon and ran to, to, to see the sun, to greet the sun, to embrace the sun while he was still a long way off, is the same father that went out to see the sun that stayed at home. The son that refused to take part in the rejoicing. The son that refused to take part in the celebration, in the music, in the dancing. The son that stayed away in the grumbling. Well, it's the same father who went to that son as well. And what he tells that son is verse 32. We had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live. He was lost and has been found. That we had to. That, That God expects our heart to be like his, not his heart to be like ours. He expects his children to be compelled with compassion, the same compassion that he has. The way that puts it here in verse 32 is we had to celebrate. Other translations say it's necessary for us to celebrate. The New King James Version says it's right that we should be merry and celebrate. I like the way that the 
that another version puts it, it behooves us to make feast and have joy. That there's a, a compulsion that pulls us along when our, our heart is like God's. And it's a compulsion to joy. Joy to take part in what God is doing here in the world. Not just to feel compassion, but to act on it. To take part in his seeking, to take part in his searching. To keep our, our eyes on the lookout for the one that's missing. And to take part in his plan. This morning, it may be that um, the rejoicing, the celebrating, the compassion, it's, it's, it's not a part of, of where you are right now. And it may not be a part of where you are right now because you've gotten active in complaining. That right living hasn't been its own reward and, and, and instead you, you've found a need to, to just think that there's somebody that you ought to be complaining about. And that this world's not going the way that it would if, if you were running the show. And that if maybe God's heart were the way your heart were that things would be different. Know that God's heart won't change. But Jesus rose from the grave in order to change yours and mine. To give strength that we don't have. To take part in his mission. That we can't just say, you know, God's here in the book. You need to read it. We can't just say God's here in the church. You need to come. We can't just say, you know, God's in our heart and he's safe and sound there. That our God is a seeking, a searching, and a finding God, and he's called you and I to be the same. And there's a world out there that longs to know the joy, longs to know the, the celebration of God who lives his life through us. And it may be that you haven't taken part in that. And I want to invite you to take part in that today. Pray with me. Jesus, we need your strength. And today is no different at all. Breathe the strength of the helper on us. To keep our eyes open for your joy, for your celebration, for the one that's lost, for the one that is missing. The one that's, that needs to be a part of what you're doing here in this world. And that one, well, it may be us. So help us to put down our, not only our complaining, but our excuses. To respond to you and, and to take part in what you're doing in the world. May it be done with a joy and a compassion. It comes from you. Jesus, this day I'm thankful you live your life through us. And I'm thankful for this church. And may we go out and live your life through us in the world. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image, 
And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.